An Introduction to the Old Testament, Unit 20, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And then we'll take a look at the development of the canon for the Old Testament. Now, in the book of Proverbs, we have some key ideas. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The way of wisdom leads to life. Proverbs illustrate a general principle, not a promise. And we need to emphasize that. There are some that take the Proverbs as a guarantee, such as train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Well, that is a general observation. It is not a promise. And so we need to keep that in mind. And wisdom leads to an understanding of the retribution principle. And we'll have quite a bit to say about that in this unit. The purpose of Proverbs is to collect the wisdom of ancient Israel and offer both instruction and example. In godly living, which we are aiming for, the wisdom compiled in the book functions to shape character and promote virtue in keeping with the commandment of Moses. More specifically, the purpose of the book is stated in the monologue to the wisdom's collection and may be summarized as a lifestyle of knowing wisdom and instruction and learning the fear of the Lord. Now, Proverbs can be taught. And so the gist of the Proverbs is to pass on information that has been gained over centuries of observation. We have the three divisions in the book of Proverbs that we'll take a look at. Uh, the discourse material, which is in chapters 1 through 9. The Proverbs, chapters 10 through 29. And then the Masoidic appendices, chapters 30 and 31. Now, at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, it is quite clear that we are to carefully observe the way in which people act. There is a term that is used for Proverbs that is mashal. And this mashal is to liken or to compare, to be equal, or to make a comparison. And this is what the book is supposed to be about. A proverb is a short, pithy saying in which a wise moral lesson or a suggestive experience is expressed in memorable form. The introduction to the book says, The Proverbs of Solomon son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding the words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Now that is what we are going to see in the book of Proverbs. And then we are told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. In the early chapters, there is warning 
against enticement. In verse 8 of chapter 1, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Now you notice that that is synonymous parallelism in poetry. And it says, They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Again, synonymous parallelism, where the first line says basically the same thing as the second with different vocabulary. The young man is warned to stay away from those who are going to try to lead him into sin. It says in verse 10, My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for someone's blood, let's waylay some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit, we will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. But their young man is not supposed to listen to them. And then we have a charge by wisdom herself. And wisdom is personified as a woman here. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. So she is determined to try to get people to do what is right. And she warns against idolatry. And she warns against adultery. Those are both a way of being defeated in the relationship with the Lord. You stick to the Lord. You do not turn to other idols. And you avoid adultery because that will lead to your death. And so this is basically the two areas that are talked about in the introduction to the book. A good illustration of this points this out is in chapter 7. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinsman. They will keep you from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive world. Adultery was quite a problem in Israel. And one of the reasons for this is that many of the men were quite old when they married, and they would marry very young girls. And so there was always the temptation to be enticed by a younger man. And so adultery was a problem. And then beginning with chapter 10, we have this section on Proverbs of Solomon. And these are generally antithetic parallelism. That is, the first line says one thing, and then there is the antithesis of that that is said in the second line. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son grief to his mother. And you notice that a but is usually there to indicate this antithesis. There are very many interesting proverbs. Some are repeated or said in almost the same words. And they are truths that have been observed by individuals. And they have written these down then in a very short pithy statement. I probably should point out which of these are the most interesting to me. 
But the thing is that as you read the Proverbs, there are some that stick out, that force you to think a little bit more than others. And so it would not be good of me to say, these are the best because they may not be the best to you. Each of the Proverbs should be taken carefully and observed, and then what are the implications involved in that proverb? From chapters 10 through 24, we have the Proverbs of Solomon, and then in 25, it says these are more Proverbs of Solomon, copied by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah was one who took a great interest in the way of the Lord, and his men have found some other Proverbs that they have added to the original ones. We see in chapter 30 the sayings of Agur, son of Jacob, and Oracle. It's hard to know whether the words are names of people or they are places. But in these Proverbs, we have a different type of Proverbs. Most of what we have seen so far have been two lines, and they're antithetic. But beginning in chapter 30, we have multiple lines in a proverb. For instance, in chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is flawless, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. And so you have four lines in that. And then in verse 7, Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. And then it goes on to explain why this has been asked. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you. And this is seen many times in the scripture when a person becomes wealthy or powerful, they then turn from God and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I enjoy that prayer because it says, I don't want too much or I may disown you, but I may have too little and I will steal and dishonor you. So give me just what I need. There are other Proverbs here that are very interesting. In verse 18, there are three things that are too amazing for me. Four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky and this is the soaring flight of a bird, the way of a snake on a rock. The snake does not have feet, and so it slithers, and so this is an amazement to the individual. The way of a ship on the high seas. The ship leaves a wake, but soon that is erased. And then the way of a man with a maiden, that is the procreation of life. So those four things are stated as amazement to the individual. In chapter 31, the sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. And we have as part of that an epilogue which is the wife of noble character. This is an acrostic. That is, it is the letters of the alphabet, successive letters of the alphabet. And it speaks about 
a wife doing the best that she can. And it is a blessing to the family. It is a blessing to her husband. And in verse 31, the last verse, it says, Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And you will find her husband at the city gate. She is supervising all the work that is done in the home, and he is able to take his place at the gate of the city and carry on the business of the city. So the last section is a very beautiful poem on the virtue of a woman. The outline that is given in the textbook is very, very useful, and I would pay attention to that. You have the appeal of wisdom from chapters 1 through 9, and then the Proverbs of Solomon, 10 through 22, the words of the wise, 22, 24, and then the sayings of the wise, also chapter 24, beginning with verse 23. And then the Proverbs of Solomon, copied by the man of Hezekiah, 25 to 29, the words of Agur, and Agur means gatherer, and Jekeh means pious, and they are from Masa. Then the words of Lemuel, king of Masa, and then the acrostic poem. So the book of Proverbs is a very practical book. And there are some people who read the book of Proverbs every month. Since you have the 31 chapters, they read one chapter each day during the month. And this is very useful to keep track of what it is that is said in the book. The book of Ecclesiastes is entirely different and there are some people who would like to take the book out of the scripture because of the message that it proclaims, but it is a very useful and instructional work. The ideas in here is that life should not be expected to be self-fulfilling. Frustrations in life are unavoidable. The seasons of life must be accepted. Enjoyment of life comes only through a God-centered world view. Now, the purpose statement of the book of Ecclesiastes is the purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is to demonstrate that there is nothing in life that is able to bring self-fulfillment or give meaning to life. Frustration and troubles are unavoidable, and we should not expect answers to why things happen. So often we say, why did that happen to me? Well, this is not a question that we should ask. Rather than pursuing self-fulfillment, we should enjoy the good things of life as a gift from God. We should recognize that troubles help to shape us as people. A God-centered approach to life accepts both success and adversity as coming from the hand of God. Both of them help us to develop our character. In the major themes, we have the retribution principle. It's in chapter 3, verses 16 through 22, and chapter 8, verses 10 through 14. And then we have experience versus revelation. There isn't as much revelation in the book as we see in other 
of the writings, but there is a lot of experience that is expressed. And then we have Epicureanism versus piety. The author says that we should enjoy life as we find it and fear God. So it's not looking just for pleasure. It's looking for a life that is satisfactory. Because it is interested in exploring life under the sun, it offers very little reflection on the presence of God and does not advance this theme. So there's not much that we normally will see here that is found in, say, the prophetic books or some of the historical material. We have no idea who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Often it is attributed to Solomon, but it is much later than Solomon. And the outline, we have a prologue in the first 11 verses. And then we have the quest in the area of wisdom and pleasure, chapters 112 through 226. Quest in the area of business, chapters 3 to 5. Quest in the area of wealth and golden mean, chapters 6, 1 through 8, 15. And then the quest is achieved in chapter 8, verse 16 through 12, 7. And then we have an epilogue. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the author tells us that he is going to look at many different things to see if they bring fulfillment to life. In chapter 1, verse 12, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, if this is Solomon, there's only one who was king in Jerusalem before him, so it really doesn't make too much difference what he says. And he says, I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. And then he goes on to speak about several different approaches that he's going to take. In chapter 2, verse 1, he decides that he would engage in pleasure. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good, but that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I cried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for a man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Noticed in every case, it doesn't matter in which facet he engages, he's always able to look at himself from a distance and see what is going on. Then he says in verse 10 of chapter 2, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward of all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And then he went to wisdom and also madness and folly, and those didn't prove to be any better. And the reason for this is in verse 15, 
of chapter 2. The fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. And that is going to be the solution of many of these, that the fate of one is exactly the same as the fate of the other. And then toil is meaningless. That's uh, chapter 2, verse 17. And a solution is found in verse 24. It says, A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And chapter 3 is a time for everything. And we know that these events happen to every one of us as we go through life. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot. And you go through all of these things. And then he asks in verse 9, what does the worker gain from his toil? He's worked hard, but what happens to that? Again, in chapter 3, verse 22, So I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work, because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? And then he talks about oppression and toil and friendlessness. All of those will come upon some people. In verse 7, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A miserable business. Now that is a person who's all alone and there's no one to help him. And then it goes on to say in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? He goes on to speak about life, and he says that we should stand in awe of God. In chapter 5, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. So it's better to listen to what God says than to try to do something yourself to please Him. In chapter 6, verse 16, this too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. And what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, 
when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. In chapter 7, it mentions that a good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. The author tells us that there is a common destiny for all. We see this in chapter 9. I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. So it is with those who take oaths, and so with those who are afraid to take them. Then he tells us that wisdom is better than folly in chapter 9, verses 15, but it really doesn't accomplish much. It says, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built large siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor but wise man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are no longer heeded. And then in chapter 11 is a section where we are told that we should remember our Creator while we are young. And this is a challenge to all of us. In verse 9 of chapter 11, Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So that a person should think about God early in life. And then there is in chapter 12, a description of old age, and I enjoy this. It says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, as talking about the posture of a person, and when the grinders cease because they are few, the teeth, and those looking through the windows grow dim, the eyes, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, the ears no longer hear those sounds. When men rise up at the sound of birds, 
that is the inability to sleep, but all their songs grow faint. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, as you grow older, heights are difficult. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along, talking about the hair that is becoming white, and desire no longer is stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home, and mourners go about the streets. So it says, remember him, that is, remember God, before the silver cord is severed, or the golden bowl is broken. And both of those are description of death. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Then we have the conclusion of the matter. He says in verse 11, The words of the wise are like goads, their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or bad. I think the book of Ecclesiastes is excellent for determining how we should live. It tells us that everything that happens is from God, and we should accept it as his will for us. Enjoy it as long as we can. Then we have the Song of Songs. Again, we have no idea who the author is of this material. It is an interesting book because it has received so much study and there are so many different views. It's the goodness of humanity created male and female in God's image. And this, I think, is a pure love song between a young man and a young woman. It's the dignity of human affections. The sanctity of human sexual expression in the context of marriage and the virtue of chastity before marriage and the virtue of faithfulness once married. And those are good qualities to follow. The purpose statement of the Book of Song of Songs, the love poetry of the songs celebrate the male-female relationship established by God at creation, and the goodness of human sexual love expressed within the confines of God-ordained marriage. And it's talking about human love. Now, there are many different interpretations of the book. First of all, I would say that I disagree with our authors of the textbook. They take this as a three-person play. I take it as a two-person play. There are seven different interpretations of the Song of Songs. And let me mention those. There is the dramatic, that it is a ancient Hebrew play it has six acts with two scenes each. And then there is a typological. God's love 
to Israel and Jesus' love to the church. Now, this is one of the reasons why the book has had acceptance within the canon, that they have made it something that I do not think it was intended to have. And then there is the cultic approach, and this is Ishtar's search for Tammuz. This comes from Mesopotamian uh, writings, and I think this has nothing to do with the cultic interpretation. There's the possibility that it is a wedding cycle that is similar to the wasp, uh, the Arabic wedding ceremonies, a number of songs that are sung during the wedding rites. I don't think that that is true either. There is a didactic which presents the purity and order of sexual love. That is a possibility that it does teach that. The allegorical, this is very much like the typological, except that the allegorical does not take historical considerations into account. The last is the literal, which is the actual love of a young man and a young woman, and that's the one to which I adhere. It's difficult to express all of the vocabulary that is used in the book. Israel is a farming community. It's rural, agricultural, and most of the images that are presented to us comes from that particular culture. We are not used to it. And so many of the items that are included seem strange to us, where the man addresses the woman and speaks of her in a way that is entirely foreign to us. She's compared to the horses in the chariots of Pharaoh, or a tree, a sheep that has just been shorn that has come up out of the washing. See, these things are entirely foreign to us, and we need to understand them if we will see what the poem is all about. It is a poem, I think, that a husband and wife should read together and thank God for all that he has done for them. Now I'd like to talk about the formation of Old Testament scriptures. Writing has been around for at least 5,000 years, from 3,000 B.C. We know that it was developed in Mesopotamia and Egypt. And the Hebrew writing begins probably around 2,000 B.C., and it is a alphabetical writing. Before this, the writing was done with pictograms, and you tried to express what you wanted in pictures, and then it was developed until it became symbolic. And an alphabet was never adhered to in Egyptian or Mesopotamia. But there is an alphabet in the Proto-Syriac language. The writing took place on several different surfaces. On rock walls, there is the inscription of Darius uh, that is written at Behistun. And the Rosetta Stone, which is written in three different scripts, on a single stone and then we have it written on clay and thousands of clay tablets have been found written on wood written on papyrus and papyrus is a reed that grows especially in Egypt this is where it was developed and the reed is split and flattened and then you have 
one that is laid at a 90 degree angle to another and then pounded and this became the paper of the ancient East. Parchment, which is the skin of animals, and pottery. Uh, broken pottery could be used to write short notes on, and you use ink in that case. Textual criticism is the observation of the texts that have been found they show us that there are many errors that have developed along with the writing. There are errors of sight, and we often find that that happens to us. If we have a paper that we are copying and we are typing, we may look at the paper and our eye goes to the wrong place, and we may repeat what we have already typed, or we may leave something out that we should have included. So there are errors of sight and sometimes hearing, because in some cases manuscripts were copied by many scribes at a single time. One of the scribes read what was in the manuscript and then the person who is writing it down hears a different word than that which was intended. And then there is the writing where the scribe will make an error as he writes. And sometimes he's using memory and his memory is faulty. So he doesn't say exactly what it should be. And sometimes judgment is a cause of error. In our Protestant canon, we have 66 books. We have 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. This is just the way that we have chosen to put that material together. Now the revelation that came from God was an authoritative utterance. Jeremiah is perhaps one of the best examples that we can use because after he had been prophesying for many years, God tells him, write down all of the prophecy I have given you. And Jeremiah is able to remember what God has said and he dictates this then to Baruch, who writes it down in a scroll. Now that is authoritative utterance and the formal written document. Now many of the prophets did the same thing where they would utter what God had told them to say to the nation of Israel and then later they would write that down. And so you have the authoritative utterance that took place first and then the formal written document. Then they began to collect these documents and to put them together. Stage three is the collecting of the written documents. And stage four is the sorting of the written documents and fixing a canon. Now, the quality of the divine revelation is one of the factors that was taken into consideration. And also the authorship. Was the prophet the one who wrote the book? Was it someone who had authority to write the book? So you look at these, which ones should be included in the canon. There are threefold division of the Old Testament. There is what we call the Tanakh. Now that is a, an abbreviation for the Torah, which is the first five books and we say that that was written by Moses. It has authority because God tells Moses, write this down. 
And then we have the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and they were told what they were to pass on to the congregation of Israel. And then we have the third division, the Ketuvim, or the writings. We know that by the time of Jesus, this was the way in which it was organized. The Torah, Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Jesus speaks about the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And Psalms makes up the good portion of that third division. The canon order that we use in our English Bible came from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. He put them in a particular order as he thought they would best fit. And when the Bible was translated from the Latin into the English, the same order of books was kept. There are some disputed books. These were not discussed as to whether they should be in the canon, but they were discussed because problems that existed in the books themselves. For instance, Esther was questioned because God is not mentioned in the book. The closest that comes to this is when Mordecai tells Esther, if you don't do this, then our deliverance will come from another source or another place. That is the closest that it comes to God. And then there is Ecclesiastes, and we have mentioned already that it doesn't seem to be a revelation of God, but it is more an observation of experience. And then the Song of Songs, because again, God is not mentioned in the Song of Songs. And so there was a question, does it really belong in the canon? And then the book of Ezekiel. And the reason for this is that Ezekiel talks about the law and the keeping of sacrifice in a way that is slightly different from that of Moses. And if you have a writing that is different from Moses, then it is questionable. So those four books were disputed. Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Ezekiel. It was never a question whether they belonged in the canon or not, but what made them suspect. And then we have the canon confirmation, and we know that by the time of Jesus, they had already decided what books belonged in the canon. But there are other books that were written, and there are 14 or 15 books that are called Apocrypha. These were written between 200 B.C. and A.D. 100. When the translation was made in the Reformation, they excluded these because they did not feel they had the authority of the other books. So the English Bible that comes from the Reformation has just the 66 books, and the Council of Trent was held by the Roman Catholic Church from 1545 to 1564, and they declared that the apocryphal books were deuterocanonical, so that they accepted them as canonical. And then we have other books that have come to light, and again, they're from 200 B.C. to about A.D. 200. There are 18 of them, and these are the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. Now, it's interesting that uh, Jude in the New Testament quotes from 1 Enoch, 
And he also alludes to the material on Moses, the assumption of Moses. But these books, the pseudepigrapha, were not included in our Protestant canon. Now, they are included in other canons. And when we talk about canon, we need to make sure which one we're talking about. There are only 24 books in the Hebrew Old Testament. That is because Samuel, Kings, Chronicles are just one book, not two books apiece. And the 12 minor prophets are included in one volume, and it's called the Prophets. And so you have to be sure that you define which canon you're talking about, because in some of the other bodies of Christendom, they accept more of the books than we do in the Protestant canon.